down a little bit. You know. Oh, what's up, everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean. And once again, I got a very special guest for you guys today. That would be none other than Uncle Adams. Now, what's up? <laughs> and just to give you guys a little quick overview on Uncle Adams, um, been in the game in for a minute, obviously, but he's a rapper and a speaker. So he does motivational speaking as, um, as well. He has a unique, interesting um, angle that he's going towards. So far, he has 2.7 million Spotify streams, 4.9 YouTube views, 27 million Facebook video views. He has that listed on his profile. We're going to dig into why and where that came from. But first, let's start off with, let's let everybody know where you're from and where you reside. Uh, like you said there, my name is Uncle Adams. Uh, my real name's Curtis, and I reside in Canada. I live in a city called Regina in the province of Saskatchewan. And usually when I tell people that, especially Americans, they're like, what, where's that? And then I tell them, it's not actually that far. I, the way I explain it is it's pretty much in the center of Canada in the big rectangular province towards the southern part, a couple hours from the U.S. border. Got you. I'm not, I'm not going to even lie. The first time you told me that, I actually thought you said vagina. So was, Everybody <laughs> does that. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's the running. That's the running joke. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. So, you have a decent amount of views on YouTube and on Spotify, Facebook, across a lot of social platforms. Even a decent uh, Instagram following. I'm, I believe it's at thirteen thousand. Not as um, big as your other platforms. But my first question is, being where you are, right? Is that an area that the music industry is popping? Is it a lot is it a bigger city i don't know i don't know anything about that place no no the, the the short answer is no um there's a bit of a music scene here but it's i don't want to say it's non-existent because it's gotten better over the years right but when i was younger like in my late teens and early 20s we would do shows and battles and stuff and i'm telling you there was maybe 10 15 20 people there so very small, very, uh, like I say, almost non-existent. And after a while, it just got tiring doing shows and stuff for that few of people. Got you. So I kind of left that behind and went to the internet. Perfect. So this is exactly what a lot of people are facing right now. There's a lot of people who yeah. are in New York, LA, Atlanta, or some pretty decent cities, but a lot of people feel like they're in the middle of nowhere. So what did your journey um, across the internet look like? How did you start building? Uh, basically, like I say there, I got sick of doing shows for 10 or 15 drunk people and I wanted to find a different way, you know, and, and reach more people. So I started on the music video grind, the independent music video grind. And my first relatively big one I dropped in 2013, uh, it was called One of a Kind. And then I just, from there, I just went on a tear, basically. Like, from then until now, I have 18 music videos, give or take one, uh, that have all been independently produced. And I've talked about a wide variety of subjects. Uh, a big one that I did was an anti-bullying song I did in 2013 called I Am Stronger. So I, I made a song to help kids dealing with bullying and stuff, and I did it with rap music in a way that they would connect. So I don't know if you've you've uh, seen that one or not, but you should check that one out. Mm -hmm. So then that one led to my emails just going crazy. My messages going crazy because uh, it got over a million views on Facebook and all these people started asking me to come to their schools. So I did start going to schools and I started rapping for gyms full of 500 kids. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> I that sneeze out, right? <laughs> yeah. I started rapping for essentially schools full of kids instead of the bars that I was doing in my younger days for 10 or 15 people. I went a different I've never seen anybody else do it, but I like doing things that other people don't do. You know, I feel like you got to experiment with stuff, break the mold, and try different things. Okay. So, yeah, that's super interesting because I, I feel like a lot of people might have looked at that route as – corny or is just not where I'm trying to go so they might not have taken that opportunity up but I was sure. talking to uh, Curtis King recently and I, I don't know if you know who he is but he's one another one of those YouTube guys you know what I mean I'm um, pretty good he's a producer like us yeah 
<laughs> yeah, well, he's one of my favorites, man. He's one of my favorites. Real great dude. Yeah, I've heard of his beats. I've yeah. heard of his beats for years. He has beats on SoundCloud and stuff, right? Yeah, I've heard yeah, Curtis, Curtis King with two S's. Man. But yeah, I love that dude. And, and one thing he said in our conversation was that there are so many lanes out there for people that, but, and that's the lane they actually probably should be in. They have a strength or maybe it might even be their calling to be in that lane, but there's so much following the stereotypical industry lane and that vision that they don't take advantage of it and they miss what um, some other lane. So I would love to hear about your mindset when this school bullying, th that whole route took off. What it, how did you initially feel about it? Were you initially like, hey, this is awesome, is just performing in front of people, it's positive, because you were so used to performing in front of 15 drunk people, or did you have some reservations at first? I definitely had some reservations because I knew that rappers were gonna say that that was soft. Yeah. And, but I, I weighed that and I decided, eh, rappers saying I'm soft or me helping tens of thousands of kids. And I chose to help the kids. And I've done that a couple different times where I, I knew that doing a certain project was going to put me, put a target on my back and people were going to diss me and people were going to say I'm soft and this and that and whatever, you know, like I, I still, I still did it. I figured it was worth it. Um, but it's satisfying doing that, you know, like I, I got a whole bunch of messages when it first started happening from kids telling me that they were going to commit suicide and then they heard the song and it helped them and it built them up from the inside and stuff like that. So even, you know, just saving one life, that's worth any attacks or anything that people have to say about me. You know what I mean? Right. That's real. That's real. But I, I can see what you're saying. Definitely. A lot of rappers will not do that because they're afraid of stepping outside of the box. They're afraid of being ridiculed. Um, but Game changers, people who switch things up, people who innovate, people who pioneer things, they face harsh criticism. You know what I mean? And you, you were talking about that lane. You said you and Curtis King were talking about the lane of the typical, stereotypical rapper. That lane is full. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Everybody does that lane. And I'm not dissing that lane. People come from all different cultures and stuff. They can do whatever they want. But I just think, like, where are you more likely to get noticed? in that lane where it's kind of all the same or branching out and sort of doing something different, but it comes at a cost, you know, it's, it's not for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. That's super meaningful, especially somebody who's coming from a space that has very little mu music scene. So for you to be open and just for some way to get out, it's interesting. So where did that take you? You're performing to start off for these turned in or at these schools. What was the next step for you? Uh, first of all, by no means am I where I want to be, you know, but I've, I've made some moves and I guess you could say that that evolved into me, uh, visiting schools all over North America. I've been to New York city. I've been to West Virginia. I've been not just schools too, other kinds of events for speaking, you know, because the speaking opens up doors that rap alone cannot mm. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. I can go into a place, speak, and then do a bit of rap at the end. Um, so I've been up to a place like called Nunavut, which is way up in northern Canada. You'll need your map for that. That's way up in those islands, super remote up there. Went and talked about anti-suicide and anti-bullying and spent some time in the community. Been all over my province. Uh, I remember the first time I did it in 2013. I went to a school in North Battleford and I did a little talk, 15-minute talk, and then I wrapped my song. And then all these kids lined up to come and meet me. Like the gym full and I couldn't believe it that they wanted to come and meet me. And, and then they started asking for my autograph. And not only that, they wanted me to write my autograph on their hats, on their coats, on their shirts, like all over everything they were wearing. And I remember being like, really, you, you want my autograph? They're like, no, no, please just do it. Please do it. So it was really cool. And, and I did that for quite some time. And now I'm at a stage where I think I'm right. I'm trying to, evolve from schools to the more musical side. Like I, I'd eventually like, like I'm looking for a booking agent and things like that, uh, mm -hmm. where I can set up a more of a musical tour and kind of yeah. focus more on that. But I think that speaking will always kind of be a part of what I do. I like to talk. Yeah. So the, the talking part was a part of, it was integrated with the whole bullying thing, right? You were going to school. You were That's speaking. how it started. 
Got it. Yeah, that's but, how it started. And I actually didn't even want to do that. I, at first, like, I was getting hundreds of messages from schools and, you know, it was kids and it was parents and it was teachers. And they're like, you got to come to the school. These kids will listen to you. And da, 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 da. And I said, no, no, thanks. You know, I, I just rap. I don't, I don't talk. I don't do public speaking. You know, at this yeah. time, I didn't do that. I had never done it before. And nope. I just kind of kept passing it off, passing it off. But I'm telling you, man, it did not stop. Like, I just kept getting messages and emails. And then one day I was like, hmm. I was like, they want me to come and they want me to talk and rap for them. I, why not? I will. So I put some information together and went on my way. So, so it came from the people. So really quick before we move on from that, this particular era of your career, how did that song get out there in the first place? Like, how did it really start to take off? Uh, YouTube. I did a YouTube video. I collabed with a local organization here and a bunch of students came out and participated in the video and then we put it on YouTube and it did okay, but it, it kind of, it actually went, it was actually going pretty slow, but I'll tell you what changed the game for that is when, uh, I think it was 2013, 2014. You remember when Facebook first integrated their video player? So you could all of a sudden upload videos right to Facebook. Yeah. It was, it was relatively new. You couldn't yep, do that, that, you know, yep, several yep. years ago. So, I was like, oh, this is neat. So I took this video that had already been out for, I think, six months or a year at that time, and I uploaded it, and it got like over a million views. That's what really, that's what really sort of spread okay. it. So it just goes to show like one piece of content, it could be sitting for a long time, and then you do something else with it, and it starts to pick up and stuff, you know? Like you yeah. got to keep pushing stuff sometimes. So yeah, that, that's, about that all the time, that man. Was great. that's wild. And you just posted it like on your uh, personal page or was it like a rapper page? It was a rapper page, but it was pretty small. You know, it was like anybody's at now. It's so I think I have like 130,000 likes or something like that. But at the time it was nothing like that. But one video man can jump your numbers huge. That's wild. And back then you probably didn't even have to do any like Facebook advertising or anything, did you? No. Yeah. No. It was when Facebook was, they were real. <laughs> yeah. I, I find that. The, the the videos that do the best are not necessarily ones that were paid to advertise. Yeah. They're ones that society watches and feels connected to and wants to comment on and want to share. You know what I mean? Like if you're just making a video rapping about all about yourself and it doesn't connect with the audience at all, it's probably not going to go viral. You know, I think, I think a lot of rappers don't understand that. Like that sometimes for a viral video, the content has to relate to the people watching it has to relate to the public right or else why yeah. would they care whoever your audience is because with you obviously that first song bullying that i mean that's been something a lot more popular these days and it's starting to really resonate with the public so i could definitely see just eating timing played a, a huge part um of yeah the video itself. so cool like let's talk about after that and you talk about right. the fact that you're moving and transitioning into the more musical side, maybe quote unquote, a more serious artist, um, maybe, um, you know, what demographic are you probably targeting? Are these people like, uh, well, well, let's compare yourself well, to an artist. I know artists hate to do that, but like, if you know, a genre, you know, you don't have to say one artist, but just a, a bucket of artists that would have similar fan bases to, to what you're going for. I would say probably, well, like I know on my similar artist tab or whatever, uh, uh, one that pops up a lot is Brock Hampton. Um, Lil B is, is interesting, too, man. Hey, they have, they say Lil B is related to you too. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah. I've heard that. A, I've heard that a lot. And he pops up on the profile there when you say, when it go when you go to uh, artists, similar yeah. artists or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I see that little B all the time. Um, from like a, yeah, like you say, rappers don't like comparing themselves to other people. But I would say probably like kind of like a logic or sort of like I'm kind of like I kind of rap like Hobson sometimes, too. But I don't be like but I'm just trying to give you an idea because I'm more of a, a lyrical rapper, I would say, rather okay. than, um, you know, the mumble rap stuff and the, and the other stuff like that. Not that, you know, I'm not one of those people that hates on all that stuff. I think there's different, there's different genres and Hey, different stuff sells and people are from different communities and stuff. But just to give you an idea, yeah, I would be more like, like logic or, um, kind of like Hobson sometimes and uh, more on the lyrical side. Okay. Yeah. I would say 
Yeah. You're definitely. Would you agree? Stylistically, you're definitely more of a lyrical type style. Yeah. It sounds like that's what you're going for. Now, how do we get these plays on Spotify? A lot of people are trying to figure it out on Spotify. How do we get these plays on YouTube? Uh. Honestly, I wish I had all the answers on that because I'm not, I'm not nearly where I want to be. Like, I made a, a YouTube series called The At Least a Million Mission where I straight up told people in a video series that I am going to get to 1 million monthly Spotify listeners. Mm -hmm. That's a target that I'm aiming for. Uh, so first of all, I, I don't claim to know everything. I'm not even where I want to be yet. But how I've gotten to where I am now, I would say that a big part of it was what we talked about earlier doing shit that other rappers aren't doing so that when somebody watches your video they remember you you know what i mean yeah and sometimes i might have pushed it a little too far even you know like there's one video where, where I, I dance around in a top hat and stuff like that and um some people didn't like it whatever but i did that on purpose so that people would watch my video and remember me rather than just scrolling and oh there's another rapper you, you know how it is Yep. You scroll down Facebook and it's sponsored ad, sponsored ad, sponsored ad, yep. all these rappers, all these singers and no offense, but most of them sound the same and a lot of them are kind of boring. So I try to do things that make me stand out, even though sometimes it puts me under intense criticism. Got you. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen that you do the whole YouTube page that YouTube were out. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that journey. What made you actually decide to say, hey, I'm going to do a little bit of the self-help um, stuff. I'm going to also integrate my own mission, like the million, um, well, the million subscriber mission, like, well, monthly listener, technically. That's right, yeah. Yeah. So how would you build that YouTube following? Because you have a, it's pretty decent if I remember correctly. Yes. It's, it's not as big as yours, but I'm trying to get there. Yeah, it's not far right. off, right? 32,000. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're pretty close, yeah. Every, a lot of these artists would like to have 32,000 people um, subscribers on YouTube. And YouTube is one of the harder places to actually build a following. So I agree. So how did, how did this happen? What happened? Uh, brick by brick, uh, I guess, you know. And again, I'm not where I want to be with the YouTube either, but I'm thankful for what I have. Um, I started with the music videos and it used to be just all music videos. And then I started realizing, Hey man, I could, I could throw on the camera and do a little bit of talking too, like some of the stuff you do, right? Like you, you put on the camera and you talk and I realized mm -hmm. that, Hey, this, people want to, people want to interact with this kind of stuff too. Like I didn't have to restrict myself to just the music, you know, mm -hmm. I could do different kind of videos, different sort of talking things. And then the At Least a Million Mission, which is the, the series where I, I'm totally honest about the debt that I've accumulated in the music industry. I tell people what my goals are, what I'm aiming for. That was sort of a bold move that I did because I figured, you know what, if I'm really doing this, if I'm really serious about doing this, then I should be able to tell the world that I'm serious about doing this. You know what I mean? And it took some balls to do that. I was actually scared for a while to do that because who wants to put that out there? What, what if you fail, right? What if you fail in front of thousands of people? But I, was, I actually haven't seen that video. What have you told people in terms of your deck? Can you go a little bit more at length in this video? Because I know it'll be helpful for sure. artists on as well. Yeah, basically, I've lost a lot of money in the music industry trusting the wrong people and uh, doing bad deals sometimes, you know? there's a, And artists watching this need to look out for that. You, you know how it is probably there's a lot of people who claim that if you pay them a lump sum of money that they're going to take the steps to get you a record deal and this or that you know i don't know it, i don't really want to go too far down the rabbit hole they can watch the series if they want the at least a million mission but i lost a lot of money in the music industry and just as a struggling artist trying to make it sometimes you know like i think a lot of people can relate to that because i quit my job and went all out toward it so i've been trying to pay my bills, pay my rent, and create all this content just from rapping and speaking, mm. which is hard, you know? Um, and like I say, I lost, I lost some money with that. And I used to have a team and I ended up firing the whole team because things didn't work out. And if people want to know more about this, you know, they, there's a song called Industry Snakes that I have on Spotify. You can listen to that. That kind of tells sort of the story. But it's not all other people's fault. You know what I mean? It's just this This is entrepreneurship. This is a crazy game. And you better be prepared to have lows and highs. And 
I talk in the series two, just I'll let you talk in a second, but I had a $300,000 contract, man, signed, done, ready to go. The bus, we were getting ready to go on the tour in the States. And then I was sitting in the bank and I got this email and it was like, cease and desist, company merger failed or something like the company, the two companies that I was going to be touring for failed to merge. And it thus made the contract void. And I essentially lost out on a $300,000 contract. But this is just some of the stuff I talk about in the series, man. But it's a roller coaster. It's up and it's down. But man, I'm never quitting. For sure, man. I mean, I definitely get that. And I've heard some similar stories. Not that one uh, with that tour and the company merger. That's, that's interesting. Um, what, did, what was that like when you were building your team, but you had to make a decision that you wanted to get? rid of the team not get rid of them but you couldn't it was you're in the wrong direction you couldn't sustain how did that feel yeah it sucked because i spent years with these people man i spent years looking for good people to work with and and first of all you can't do much in the music industry without a team you know and young rap i don't know do, do quite a few young rappers and singers watch your channel i mean it's people of all ages yeah so, so yeah i, I want to stress that that it's important to have a good team. And I thought I had a really good team built, but then I started finding out some sneaky stuff that was going on. Um, I'm not going to mention names or get too much into the details, but money was spent where it shouldn't have been. People were saying other people were taking money. And then I would confront one person and be like, he said you were taking money. And he'd say, Oh no, that guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. So how can you have a team like that when you don't know who's lying and who's telling the truth? So I decided, I have to start from scratch as hard as it was. And that's where I am right now. Like people look at my accounts and stuff and they're like, you're verified on social media. You got all these followers. Like you got all these, these records and stuff, but you have no team. So then I have to explain to the, them the story. That's why like currently I'm, I'm totally so, solo. Uh, I don't have, I don't have a record deal. I don't even have a manager right now, but I'm looking for those things. How long have you been solo? Oh, several months. Got gotcha. you. Yeah, but you got to be picky with this, you know, like you, I'm, if you're going to take on a manager, you want to make sure that you're partnering with someone that you really think it's a good fit, you know, because a lot of people can maybe claim that they're a manager or something, even though they're not going to do much for you. You know how it is. Yeah. You know how that is, right? Yeah, right, well, so I'm rebuilding. How about this then? Original. Now that song yeah. is post-bullying era, right? Oh yeah, several yeah. years later, three years later. That that song has about 800k on Spotify right now. Yeah, that's a controversial song. What happened? Why is that song so controversial? Like, what were the reactions that you saw that were controversial? Because I wouldn't take that as a controversial song at all, personally. Um, so that's me, me neither, really. Um, when I first made it, I was just kind of like, all right, you know, like I knew it was catchy, I knew it was fun, and I decided that I wanted to make a different kind of music video. I wanted to do something in the music video where people would be scrolling and they would see my music video and they'd be like, what? What is this? What's this guy doing? This guy's in a top hat. Have you seen this guy? You got to check it out. I wanted it to be memorable, right? right? So I dressed up in three different costumes in the video. If you watch the music video, I think I wear a chef's hat in the end and in the, in the start, I wear a top hat and in the middle, I have a crazy thing in the side of my head and stuff. And I just did different stuff. And so actually for the first little while, that video wasn't really that controversial, but then um, some people started to kind of make fun of it. And then it turned into a group of people. And then one really big thing that happened was uh, Anthony Fantano. You know him? You know yeah, Anthony of course. Fantano? Yeah. yeah. So he, he gave me a review. Really? He reviewed original. It was not a good review. It was not good. It was like a 20 minute review. Uh, but there's more to the story. So anyway, that, that sent a ton of negative traffic over to my channel, to my videos. And I wasn't used to that, man. I was used to people like praising my stuff, like, you know, until the, all these people came over. So it actually got really bad, man. I, got, I had like a lot of, lot of crazy trolling and impersonation and people harassing my fans. And, yeah. But anyway, then there's videos about all this on the internet, by the way. And then Anthony Fantano and I, we started talking about this. 
And he invited me on his channel and we did a video together, actually very similar to this, how we're doing an interview right now. Really? And uh, he told me about some of the crazy trolling he uh, went through and stuff. And the video is called Burying the Hatchet with Uncle Adams. Okay. And then uh, now we follow each other on Twitter and yeah. So it's interesting. So that's, it, it kind of, basically it wasn't controversial at the start, but like I said, a piece of content can change. All of a sudden it gets into some different hands or something and it gets on a different platform and that's, it's been a crazy ride with that song. I never thought it was going to do all that. That's really important because um, the point of that, just how we talk about how some songs or pieces of content can take off and go viral just because it happens to get discovered or more visibility. The fact that a song can literally change almost its impact due to the context of the era or the whatever platform that it's on is something that we don't talk about as much. Um, a prime example is really when you look at some of the behavior that people get looked down upon these days in pop culture or or how or how they might talk to women or things like that, right? There was a certain era where it was so normal, right? And it was such a norm. So we take some of the stuff from back then and then you bring it into this day and it's wild. But back then it was yeah. of course it doesn't mean necessarily it was right or wrong, but just changing the context of when something's taking place or who's the person who puts it on their platform in front of a different fan base, all those uh, types of things can literally change the impact and the trajectory of the song. So it's really cool to see you that you said that. I was looking at the video a little bit. It, it's a little wild. It's interesting, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. The, the way you have this like cheese on, like cheese, like you're smiling. It almost looked like you yeah. had a mask on or something. Like it was, it was interesting. I, I, my thing about that so it, i know you got a lot of negative feedback and when i hear your style and your type of music i can see how it got out and um and really touched a lot of kids right i know you're talking because where you started and now some of the music i've heard the production value isn't necessarily super high when i listen to the audio part like the your voice right so my question to you is, are you still doing it? Like, what, what is your process? Because I know some people are trying to distort or they're trying to remain a certain type of authentic by not overproducing and leaving their voice sounding a little bit, I don't know, distant on the track or in different ways. And then, or it could just be your process where you haven't invested in certain things for whatever reasons. What, why is that when it comes to your music? Well, maybe it's because it's my real voice and I don't have 10, 15 plugins on my voice. Like a lot of rappers do where it's to the point where it's not even really them anymore. It's computers and shit, you know, and if yeah. they want to do that, that's fine. But when you hear me, you know, we do some compression, I think, and we do a little bit of mixing and stuff like that, but we don't put a bunch of effects on my voice. Like when I rap, it's me. Mm. Um, but as far as production quality, like I record in one of the best studios in Canada. And every time I send my records to music executives and stuff, they're like, wow. They're like, where do you record? They, they're like, this sounds like it was like recorded at like Republic or Atlantic or something like that. And like New York or LA, they always say that to me. So all the equipment's on point. Uh, the studio is absolutely phenomenal. If my music sounds different than other rappers you're listening to, it's because of what I just said there with the, uh, I don't put a bunch of effects on me, on my voice. You know, I just, I don't know, maybe I'm old school or something or from a different time where we just don't really do that too much but uh that's how i like it and that's how my fans like it so i don't know Pe people go listen and be the judge yourself i guess but i can see why you think that's so different because in this era is major like uh plugins right people put all kinds of plugins on their vocals and stuff like that oh uh, yeah a lot of them <laughs> okay i mean that's fair enough i mean I, and also i don't know which era like I've heard a few of your songs. I, I've went and listened to some things, but they're from, I don't know the years that each song came out or anything. Um, another question though, back to Anthony Fantano, that situation and negativity, I find yeah. it really intriguing. So it's just indicative of the fact that a lot of artists, at any moment you can blow up and you could or could cannot be prepared for it, right? 
because you don't know when it's coming or where, where it's coming from when it comes to a, a video that might go viral. When it came to that song, you said you got a lot of negative feedback. What was the worst part about the negative feedback that you didn't seem to be used to? And how did you handle that personally? From well, first of all, at the time, my YouTube channel had like 20,000 subscribers. And Anthony's had over a million. Of course, yeah. So when he gave me the bad review, and I don't, I don't hold this against him or anything. Like we've, we've long since squashed all this. But you got to understand that the numbers, the traffic that came over from a channel with a million subscribers to a channel with 20,000 subscribers, it was crazy, man. Like it was, it was honestly insane. Like all the stuff that was coming over and people saying stuff and like telling, saying horrific things to my fans and fake emails and people pretending to be people they weren't just lots of weird trolling stuff that most people would never understand. And I never understood until it got to that point either. Yep. Um, but yeah, to be honest, man, like it, it was no joke. Like it was really, it was really like invading on my personal life and stuff. And I was just like, wow, I didn't, I didn't believe I never, uh, I didn't think that that would happen, but um, I guess you could say that my strategy worked. Right. My strategy of having that smile on my face and wearing that top hat and dancing around and the combination with the song. Like I told you, I wanted to make something that would stand out from the rest, from the boring right. shit. Right. And although it was turbulent. Uh oh, you just went for a while. It worked. Um, Radar and he did a review on it. And even though it was a bad review, he gives a lot of big artists bad reviews, you mm -hmm. know? So in a way it's flattering to even get a bad review from Anthony. Like it really is, you know, because he's so influential uh, on YouTube. Yeah. So when I weigh it all and I look back on it, it was mission accomplished. It was more turbulent than I thought, but it got me a lot of exposure from one song and one music video. And it's not all bad, by the way. A lot of people listen to that song. It's my biggest song. And on Spotify, it's, uh, like you said, it's over 800,000. It'll be at a million in no time. Mm. Million streams. How long ago was this, by the way? Well, I released the song in 2016, but those events transpired between then and now. It okay. was quite a ways after it was released that he, like you said, how it, things can change and something happens and spikes the content. It was quite a while after the original release. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? The original, original release? Yeah. Because the song's called Original. They almost didn't <laughs> let me name it Original. They said, this name is too generic, like it's, you know, because it's not specific enough. Yeah. But yeah, so it was, it was a while after it was actually released before, before all that even happened. I, I just think that's wild because the, I'm sure by what you're saying, Anthony basically gave it a, a negative review. Um, and the fact that, and I'm sure he might have played it up, made fun of it and all that kind of stuff. And the fact that so much traffic came from someone making fun of it or not saying something is bad is just weird to me because I always like if someone tells me something's bad, I don't go to look to it or but I don't really understand really uh, being a troll. I'm just not a troll. <laughs> I don't really. Yeah, you're you're a normal person. You don't have time to do shit like that. Yeah, there's people who do that stuff, man, like big yeah. time. That that's interesting. So all right, what's what's next for you, man? Um, it seems like you've had a lot of scenarios where you stumble into something on purpose or not it seems to be even more so actually not on purpose but you've capitalized on the little cracks that opened up for you and figured out how to make it work for you personally no matter what other people might think about your music or the brand that you have going about you what's next um for you well uh, first of all um you know, all of this is on purpose. Like I set out to become a rapper that people recognize. I want to get bigger as a rapper, basically. And I started that in 2013 with the music videos. And yeah, it's kind of taken a long time. And there's been some major bumps in the road and stuff. But I am doing that. You know, I am, I am getting bigger. More people are finding out about me. But with that said, I'm not where I want to be. Um, like I say... In the series, I tell people I'm going to get to a million monthly Spotify listeners. And a lot of people would never say that, especially on the internet to thousands of people. But that's one of my next major objectives. And 
I'm obsessed with doing that. And I'm so serious about doing it that I told everyone that I'm going to do that. So I'm working toward that. But with that said, I'm also working toward building another team because goals like that become smaller when you have a good team behind you. Mm. So in the foreseeable future, those are a couple things that I'm working toward. Uh, I also want to get out there and start performing live more. You know, I want to come down in the States and hopefully get another tour set up. One that doesn't fall through like that one that I told you about that $300,000 contract. So yeah, to keep going onward and upward, eventually I want to get a deal. I mean, every, every rapper wants to get a deal, right? And I'm no exception. Uh, I want a record deal. I want to get over a million monthly Spotify listeners. I want a good team to build a good team. And I want to get on tour. And I don't just sit here and say, oh, I want those things to come to me. Those are things that I'm working toward every single day to make them happen. You know what I mean? Yep. Okay. Interesting, interesting, man. I really think your story is, once again, one of going the path less traveled uh, for better yeah. in terms of what other people might think. But that's one of the things that attracted me to at least chop it up with you because- There you go. Once again, I don't see people going this kind of route and owning this kind of route. I mean, you can think about artists like Lil B, right? A lot of people, might call him trash or have called him trash. But after a certain period of time, you know, more people will respect him and give him, but there's still a lot of people who do not like his music. And he has his own cult following that works for him. So it seems right. that, you know, you have a following that is working for you and developing for you. I mean, to the point where other people were attacking your fans. You talked a lot about your fans. And I think that's dope that you have your own fan base because so many people, once again, aren't they're so busy trying to go the already beaten path where it's already crowded that they don't get to they don't get um to have like a lot of legitimate fans at all because they fail to stick out so um salute to you for that uh, for sure and if, if there's um anything you want to leave everybody with go ahead and do that uh, your social media any of that good stuff Sure, man. Yeah. First of all, thanks for, thanks for having me on here. I appreciate that. And I wish you the best with your channel. Keep on growing and maybe we'll do another collab in the future. Uh, to all your viewers, if you want to check me out, it's Uncle Adams, U-N-K-L-E-A-D-A-M-S. Uncle Adams. My name is the same on every social media. You just type that in and I'll pop right up. Uh, all my accounts are verified. So you know that it's me. And uh, if you want to check out the At Least a Million mission, uh, you can head over to my YouTube channel. Maybe you'll leave a link in the bio so people can check that out. Would you do that yeah, for me? Send me a few links over and I'll put them in. Okay. Awesome. So click the link in the bio, guys. You can head over to my channel and uh, maybe hit the subscribe button and watch some of my videos. And yeah, other than that, thanks a lot, my man. It's been good talking to you. Good chopping it up with good people in the industry. Hey, for sure, man. Hey, I don't really consider myself in the industry, but I'm out here on YouTube. <laughs> Yeah, well, you, I've watched some of your videos. You know what you're talking about. Yeah. Keep going, man. Yeah, you know, for sure. Hey, once again, everybody, if you like this video, go ahead and hit that like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, yeah. you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button.